Hi there, true crimes. Hi everyone, thanks for being here. I want to give you a brief update before we dive into our first episode of Tiger True Crimes. From now on, my podcasts will not be what you normally expect them to be. I'm doing a hybrid between boots on the ground with a sidekick of narrations focusing on cases from all across the country. I'll not only talk about what happened, but I'll give you a literal tour of the places where these events took place. How cool is that? Well, Come with me as we examine the Rosemar Beauty School Massacre in Mesa, Arizona. This case happened not far from where I grew up, which is why it's so intriguing to me. As many of you know, I've been fascinated with true crime stories since I was a child, and I felt I had to share this one with you since it was so close to home. Most of you probably haven't heard of this case. I hadn't either until my mom and I were driving near Stapley in Maine, and she pointed out a building which in 1966 made headlines for one of the worst massacres in the United States. Robert Benjamin Smith, also known as Benny, was born in 1948. He was the son of a major in the Air Force Reserves. With his father off and away, Benny felt neglected and out of place. It didn't help that his family frequently moved and the constant relocation made it hard on him. Troubled from infancy with an apparent learning disability, Benny repeated several grades. He was so problematic that he failed to master ordinary tasks, such as tying his shoelace or riding his bike. He was often avoided and teased at school, but eventually found happiness while obsessing himself with books, mostly about great and charismatic figures of history, like Caesar, Napoleon, and especially President John F. Kennedy. Despite lacking social skills and dealing with his learning disability, Benny, like most children, dreamed of making his mark on the world. His visions of grandeur for himself had him seeking attention in the most peculiar ways. Until he hit 13, Benny appeared to be a typical troubled preteen, going through a phase that time and maturity would supposedly heal, but it never did. Rather, on November 22, 1963, the day that President John F. Kennedy was assassinated, Benny's life took a turn into a direction that even his parents later questioned. Coincidentally enough, this exact date marked a major turning point not only in the United States with the loss of a beloved president, but also in the 15-year-old's life. At the time, his family was living in Baltimore and Benny begged to go to the funeral of the late President Kennedy, some 45 minutes away in Washington, D.C. When his father said no, Benny appeared to understand, but inside, the birth of a new obsession was brewing. With the murder of his hero fresh on his mind, Benny grew deeply fascinated and found himself turning what should have been a horrific event far away from his memory into a daily memoir where he kept a scrapbook on the assassination and as time went on his parents noticed something even more peculiar. Benny's focus and worship from heroes like Kennedy quickly turned into an obsession with monsters, assassins, outlaws, and murderers. He delved into stories and followed media on famous murderous icons like Lee Harvey Oswald, John Wilkes Booth, Brutus, Jesse James, and Hitler. He started reading compulsively, mostly about crime, rarely interacting with even his parents. It was the beginning of the end for Benny and it would soon be the last moments his parents would see of him for a long while. By the time the family relocated to Mesa, Arizona in 1965, Benny had become downright sinister. Although his grades picked up, his social situation worsened. He was described as a loner who got good grades, even good enough to get him elected to the student council, but not good enough to gain him friends. Again, setting the pace for what Benny would later tell reporters was his opportunity at fame. Neighbors reported that Benny was always alone and rarely talked to anyone. His teachers said he daydreamed in class so much that when called on, he seemed annoyed and agitated that he was being disturbed. 
He was weak in nature and at times clumsy and slow. He lacked the stealth of an athlete, although a handsome young man. Academically, Benny was nothing shy of average. Even his nomination to student council was not enough to change the direction he chose to go. His odd traits and habits took away any possibility of him leaning on his personality or sense of humor, especially when trying to approach women. The few times Benny did speak to people, the words and ways he used to describe his ideas and thoughts were said to be harsh and evil. In religious discussions, he always referred to God as the so-called God. In political ones, he suggested using germ warfare to wipe out everyone in Southeast Asia because they are not important, he would say with a smirk. As weird as his views may have been for a teenage boy in the 1960s, no one ever dreamed where his questionable ideas would have taken him, not even his parents. In the summer of 1966, the Texas Tower sniper, Charles Whitman, who climbed to an observation deck at the University of Texas Austin campus and started shooting, killing 14 and injuring 31. Shortly after these horrors, Benny started planning a bloodbath of his own. He considered a few sites, like his school, where he thought of wiping out all of his teachers, but for some unknown reason he quickly abandoned that idea. Within time, and after much thinking, Benny finally decided on the perfect place. It would be a place that to this day has remained open to the public. Benny woke up early on Saturday, November 12th, got dressed and grabbed a paper bag and filled it with plastic sandwich bags, some nylon cord, tape, a hunting knife, and extra ammunition. All the items he intended to use to pull off his deadly dream. In addition to the items in the bag, Benny packed a 22 caliber pistol, which his parents had given him for target practice. Inspired by Richard Speck's mass murder of eight nursing students four months prior and seeking the same fame Speck gained from the murders, Benny honed in on the Rosemar College of Beauty in his hometown of Mesa, Arizona. He knew it would be filled with many students, beauticians, and housewives giving him a significant amount of victims. That morning, students Benita Sue Harris, Mary Olson, Glenda Carter, and Carol Farmer were getting ready for a busy day at the beauty school. One customer, Joyce Sellers, arrived and was already waiting with her two little daughters, Deborah and Tammy Lynn. Sellers usually came to her appointments alone, but on this day, she could not find a babysitter. Benny entered the school, and when the women paid no attention to him, he fired one shot into the air. Then he ordered them to go into the back room and lie on the floor in a circle with the children, with their heads in the center and their legs like wheel spokes. Newspapers would call this the will of death. One of the women attempted to intimidate Benny by telling him there will be 40 people here within minutes. Benny replied, I'm sorry, I didn't bring enough ammunition for them. Benny's original plan was to tie the women up, place large sandwich bags over their heads and watch them slowly suffocate. To his dismay, however, the bags were too small to fit over their heads and he resorted to using the gun he brought as a contingency plan. Mary Olson started to pray and Benny asked what she was doing. Another woman said, she's praying if you don't mind. I do, Benny replied, and aimed and pulled the trigger. Olson was the first to die. Among his other failings, Benny was not a good shot. It took three bullets to extinguish Olson. After putting two bullets in the head of three-year-old Deborah and seeing her squirming, Benny stabbed her in the back with a hunting knife to ensure her death. In a final desperate act, Deborah's mother, Joyce Sellers, with three bullets in her head, saved her three-month-old daughter, Tammy Lynn, by throwing herself on top of Tammy. Benita Sue Harris was wounded in the head and arm and survived by playing dead, and said that she heard Benny laughing as he kept firing. Eventually, Eveline Cummings, the school operator, came into the building hearing a man's voice and funny popping sounds. She panicked and called the police. Three of the victims were alive by the time police arrived but died a short time later. Harris was admitted to the hospital in critical condition with Joyce's baby, Tamerlin Sellers, who survived a gunshot wound to her arm as she had been shielded from a headshot by her mother's body. When police arrived, Benny was casually walking out the door with a grin on his face. I shot some people, he said. They're back there. The gun is in the sack. In a statement later, Benny said he was disappointed with the tally. On Saturday morning, the Rosemar Salon was usually packed with women who wanted to look pretty for date night. 
He was asked what he would have done if his own mother and sister had been in the room. He said, I would have shot them too. I wanted to kill 40 people so I could make a name for myself. I wanted people to know who I was. The following day, November 13th, the New York Daily News headlines read, Youth Kills Five and Laughs. Just like Benny fantasized, the world took notice of this lackluster character. And as detectives, psychologists, teachers, and family delved into the details of this teen's life, they realized there had been subtle warning signs for years, but no one had seen them. If they had, do you think this crime would have still taken place? Only Benny would know for sure. But one thing is for certain, Benny gained the fame he's silently been dreaming of since he was a child, and for him, the price was well worth the crime. On October 24, 1967, after a trial that lasted 32 days, a jury took less than two hours to find Benny guilty on five counts of murder in the first degree. The sentence was death, execution in Arizona's gas chamber, but the conviction would be reversed on appeal. His sentence was softened to life in prison. For more than four decades, he has remained behind bars where mercifully he has been prevented from leaving any other marks on the world. This is the back room of the Rosemar Beauty College where Robert Benjamin Smith had everybody lay down on the floor and systematically executed five people. We're going to be covering those details uh, during our podcast, but we would like to thank Maria. Would you want to say something, Maria? No? Um, we'd like to just thank you for letting us come in here today and being so friendly and allowing us to... Uh, bring this to our viewers. So, well, good luck with your project. Yeah. Thank you very much. These people here at the, I'm not sure what the hair place is called now, but they are fantastic. They've been extremely friendly and welcoming here for us to show this video to you. So, 